going to be talking today about quantum field theory and some of the most striking and amazing things we've learned about it in recent years. One of the founders of quantum field theory and a wonderful, great, great physicist, Paul Dirac, was once asked to describe his philosophy of science. And this was after a lecture, and so he was a quiet man, and so he walked up to the board and wrote in huge capital letters, physical law must be mathematically beautiful. And in many ways, the story I'm going to tell you today is about how even the beautiful laws that Paul Dirac described and that have, that have guided, even though beauty has guided our physical, our search for the laws of nature um, for the last hundred years, we're discovering every day right now that it's mind-bogglingly more beautiful than even Paul Dirac could have ever imagined. Lots of things that couldn't possibly have worked out as well as they do, do. Um, so let me start with the big picture. So quantum field theory is a mathematical framework um, in which we describe base our most precise and most fundamental laws of the universe. It's, you should think of it as something like calculus, a little, little bit after Newton. So quantum field theory is just a set of mathematical tools and tricks, and uh, it's a language which generalizes calculus to take into account two aspects that Newton's laws don't quite work um, ultimately, which is that there's an irreducible in, um, uh, randomness from quantum mechanics and also the um, funny way particles behave near the speed of light at very, very high energies. So, but just like calculus, um, it was useful to more than physicists. Um, quantum field theory has many, many applications. And while I could tell the same story using examples from finance or biophysics or other things, um, I'm, I chose to start, um, I chose to pull an example from someplace very close to my heart as a, as a theoretical, as a particle physicist, which um, is about scattering of gluons, is my example. And I realize that not everybody knows about gluons. Um, and so um, I want to take us briefly to a, a place where they spend a lot of time thinking about gluons, CERN, the Center for European Nuclear Research. Now, as an undergrad here, I, my, uh, I got to spend two summers working in a laboratory, at, well, in that laboratory, working for um, one of the two major collaborations for the Large Hadron Collider, which is currently running. And so there's, you can see them there. There's uh, CMS and ATLAS. ATLAS stands for Large Toroidal LHC Apparatus. It's a horrible acronym. <laughs> but this, is, this detector here is seven stories tall. You can't see the people in it, but I'm sure there are little people they put in there. Um, and 40 million times a second, they collide two protons into each other. And two protons, and if you haven't seen a proton up close yourself, protons are made of um, quarks that are held together by gluons. So um, I'm going to talk about um, what happens when you collide these gluons into each other, which happens many millions of times a second at the Large Hadron Collider. Now, um, okay. Now, of course, you've probably heard in the news that, we're, that the Large Hadron Collider is being used to probe new laws of physics. But in order for you to see that, you need to understand that big spray of debris and what, it actually, what the predictions are of our current understanding of physics. And to do that, you need to use quantum field theory. And so you open up a textbook and you learn the rules. So let me give you a uh, two-minute crash course on quantum field theory. And although I won't give you the mathematical details, I think this will be honest. So the picture that we have for quantum field theory is so compelling and simple. And it comes from this man, uh, Richard Feynman, here, who, when he came up with it, it seemed so crazy that it was so simple um, that almost nobody took him seriously until it was proven mathematically that it was the same as what the hard ways people were doing it before. So Feynman changed the way we think about the laws of physics into something which, is, which every elementary school kid can, can really understand, um, the way we describe the laws of physics today. So, he suggested that we, the input to quantum field theory, description of nature, should just be a list of elementary things that can happen, and it should be a very small list. So for example, in, 
if you just wanted to know about how gluons interacted with each other, um, there's a few processes. So, and they all kind of get put in these nice graphics. They're called Feynman diagrams. And the idea is that so time is going vertically, and if the first thing that a gluon could do is just do nothing. It's the most boring thing, but let's include it. So the gluon just stays put, moves in time, our time advances. So we, lit, we add that picture. Okay, another thing a gluon can do is it can split off into two. And so we add that vertex. And lastly, two of them can scatter and create another two. And that's it. So those three pictures, if you combine them in all the possible ways, um, basically describes quantum chromodynamics, this theory of the strong force which holds together the quarks inside the nuclei and the nuclei together. Um, and in fact, are the standard model of particle physics, all of our understanding of the essential laws are basically a list of vertices like this. And physicists always actually think whether or not they describe it in those terms, they think in terms of Feynman diagrams. Um, and it's a very compelling thing because in order to calculate the distribution of gluons that could come out of some collision, all you need to do is sum over all possible ways it could ever happen. It's a very simple principle. And so Feynman diagrams uh, are, are the uh, tool, so it's the crank you turn, um, and you just add them all up, and you take a course in quantum field theory to figure out what, what to do with these graphs, um, and uh, you get some horrible expression out, and that's the prediction. Okay. And so just an example, this is a fun one because um, almost nobody who's had a course in quantum field theory can do it, um, is just to take two gluons and have four come out. And so you start off with that diagram, it could do that, it could do that, it could do that. Yeah, but there, there are 220 different diagrams that contribute, and that's way too much for a homework assignment. Um, and before computers, it's pretty much too much for anybody. And in fact, it was first calculated in 1985. It was a truly heroic computation. They had to use all sorts of fancy tricks um, by Park and Taylor. And when they got the answer, they rushed it to publication. And the final formula they came up with, simple, eight pages. And so it was rushed to publication. This is what the eight pages look like. <laughs> I mean, th and, and this was totally breaking, I mean, this, this is breaking new ground. And I wish I knew what inspired them, but somehow they closed the paper on an extremely quixotically uh, optimistic note. See, they closed by saying, so furthermore, we hope to obtain a simple analytic form of the answer, making our result not only an experimentalist, because it'd be easy to evaluate, but also a theorist's delight. <laughs> I don't know what they saw in those eight pages, but they must have seen something, because six months later, they guessed um, a formula, and they checked it on the computer that it matched those eight pages. And the guess that they came up with, I'm not going to describe what the, what the notation means, but it doesn't even matter, because it's so elegant. That's what they guessed. Those eight pages is that formula. And the first thing you'll notice about this formula is that it couldn't, how could it possibly care that it was six instead of 10 or 100? And so they actually guessed that, predicted that maybe it should just be the same formula for all n, for any number of particles. Two goes into any number. I mean, this was amazing. So I don't know what they were expecting, but this was way more of a theorist delight than they could have imagined. And for many years, I mean, so, so this calculation is completely typical. So the, the two things that keep me up most nights these days <laughs> are that, that quantum field theory is extremely hard, and yet all of its predictions, it's a truly universal feature, are simple like that. And they always encourage you to wonder how you, how you could have missed it. How could you just not guessed that formula? You know, couldn't we have some rules that weren't Feynman diagrams, maybe, that would just give you that answer? And that, um, that came about, actually, by a few researchers right at the beginning of my, uh, well, the middle of my undergrad here. In fact, one of the first talks I went to uh, in, when I was at CERN was at, um, at a string theory conference in Paris, and they, uh, they spoke, this, this was the hot big news. So Ruth Brito, Freddy Cachazzo, um, and Bo Fang came up with a, an experimental um, new set of rules that would reproduce the Feynman expansion somewhat. 
And their rule, I'm not going to describe what the pictures mean. They're not Feynman diagrams. And if we don't understand what they, they don't have any physical picture. Like Feynman diagrams are very compelling, but these, I have no idea what these mean. Um, <laughs> but they're easy to calculate. And one of the f features that immediately makes you love these, these things is that, is that for the Park-Taylor amplitude, this 2 to 4 process, or 2 to n, it always gives you the Park-Taylor formula. And it's because, so the way this works is you feed in on the left and the right-hand side all the little, the same image again and again and again. So to give you this example, the six particle one, you draw that picture and then you blow up that corner and you blow up that corner until you just get a bunch of trivalent little vertices. And you glue them all together and you get some function, and that's the Park-Taylor formula. But it's the only calculation that we had that just immediately gives you the right answer. Um, now, there are kind of, I tend to be very uh, in the optimistic camp. So when something turns out beautiful, it probably uh, has to be deep and true. But you, know, you might have noticed that I, you know, I emphasized that this was only to the leading order. And it turns out that these BCF, that these, that these formulas, these little graphs, and the functions that come out of it, the generalizations of Park-Taylor formula, are all just as beautiful as Park-Taylor. In fact, they're so beautiful, they're embarrassingly beautiful. In fact, so, so physicists usually define a quantum field theory in terms of some nice properties that they, that they would like to have the theory have. And the nicest conceivable theory, um, in, in many ways, um, has a horrible name, and it's maximal supersymmetric Yang-Mills, doesn't matter. But, but what was amazing was that only after people calculated these graphs using this recursion relation, they realized that it had an infinite amount of more symmetry. There were more ways of redefining the theory from scratch than they had ever dreamed of. And in fact, none of them could be captured by the Feynman diagrams. And so the theory was way, way smarter than the theorists who came up with it. And this is pretty ubiquitous. In fact, it's also a property of just ordinary gluons. So some people tend to be pessimistic and think that's going to go away. But in recent months, um, uh, then literally in recent months, um, we've now seen that this doesn't have to, I don't have to add the caveat of just the leading order anymore. Because now, this term gets corrected by one more term. And this is computationally powerful enough to have extended our reach dramatically farther than what anybody had ever been able to do before. In one day, I set almost every computational record as soon as we had this formula. It was great. Um, uh, but um, OK, so, this, so I'm not going to explain this, this, this formula, but it's very elegant. And it means that this is now a fully complete redefinition of quantum field theory without Feynman diagrams, for which every term has this exceptionally crazy amount of beauty and simplicity and more symmetry than you ever imagined and way, way nicer than anything you could have expected. Um, and just to give you an idea of just what I mean by how beautiful these things are, um, it turns out that uh, by just a, one of those amazing coincidences of history, um, a group, my, my, my colleagues and I, and um, um, were, were studying these things intimately, and, and my advisor and Freddy Cachazo and, and some collaborators had proposed this, uh, this the way to interpret these graphs um, with this weird space that scared a lot of people for a while. But it turned out that, of course, we didn't read the math literature all that much, but it turns out that at the exact same time, there was a group of people based in MIT and kind of spread out. Um, doing exactly the same thing, drawing the same pictures. Now we go back in the literature and we can see the same graphs. And they're talking about the same spaces. But they didn't think about quantum field theory, and we didn't know anything about what they were doing. Um, and turns out, one of, the, one of the mathematicians just down the street from Harvard at MIT, so it's been very exciting, been a lot of time. But the key thing is what are the, so one of the insights that we've learned is that these graphs, what these objects are, these Park-Taylor formulas, they turn out to be nothing more complicated than the volume of some polytope, some ball in some number of dimensions. And they have weird shapes, and they're not quite flat balls, but, but they are, but they are um, uh, very, very easy to calculate. And they satisfy lots of nice properties, because volumes are, you know, you can add them together, you can chop them up. It's great. 
And furthermore, it turns out that these graphs um, are really not so complicated. I don't actually need to send you the graph for you to get everything you need. Um, and this is a fun trick that I wish that every combinatorist, I'm sure, knows, but, no, but none of my friends in quantum field theory knew about, which is that if you have any two graph with three vertices and two colors, um, start on the outside and turn left every time you, you see a white vertex and turn, and turn uh, right every time you see a blue vertex, and you get a map from the legs to themselves. It's a permutation. And it turns out, so all of the content of that graph is just that list of numbers, those six numbers, three, five, six, one, two, four, which makes it dramatically easier to describe these functions and also understand all of their properties. Um, so these days, it's been a lot of fun um, uh, generating. These new recursive definitions of quantum field theory have, have opened up vast new vistas um, in which we can study how beautiful the, the theory is. And at every turn, it's, it's been more beautiful than we expected. So that's what I wanted to tell you about today. Thanks. <laughs>